Alright, I think that's how to do it. Did I get double around that? Did the bells already go? Alright, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Bible study and Sunday school. I'm Pastor Jennings, your host for this morning. We appreciate you being here and uh, being with us online as well. For those of you who are watching there this morning, um, as we begin, we are continuing our study of the 12 disciples here in Adult Bible Study. And we also have Sunday school for the kiddos as well. Take a breath. Let's have a prayer at the end. Dear God in heaven, we thank you for this liquid sunshine we see this morning, and we are grateful for as always to be in your house. Thank you for bringing us here safely when you ask for safe travel for those who are still on their way. Be with us during our time this morning as we continue to hear your word and how it blesses us and through all the gifts that you've given to us and the 12 disciples and the story that we hear in the Bible, just to remind us of uh, your love for us. And we thank you for all those who are here, for the teachers and the kiddos and, and all the adults as well. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, this last Wednesday was Ash Wednesday, and so now I've started a new tradition here. Because of my former church, we ordered the ashes for a dollar and a little packet about this big that I used to use for Ash Wednesday. But uh, So I burned the palm branches. Uh, this is me in my backyard. There's the palm branches and there's my uh, little tin that I bought to burn the ashes in my backyard on Tuesday. This is what it looked like before I started. So there you go. And this would look like what it looked like when I was here. And then I had on plenty of ashes and ashes left over. Yeah. You notice this, there's one thing the same in this picture and this picture? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's the, beer, that's, beer. that's the champagne of beers, they say, right? You can't get on the barbecue without having a nice cold beverage. That's what I like to say at least. But I didn't think anybody would care. I could Photoshop it out and make no, it bigger. No. All right, well, we've got some birthdays to celebrate this week as we had head from February to March, by the way. March 1st is Wednesday, in case you're uh, counting on your calendar how quickly our year is already going. Yes. But we have Max Mueller has a birthday coming up this week. Did I see him back there? Oh, there he is. So please join me in singing the birthday song. Thanks for our friends who celebrate. birthdays this week, coming up in the beginning of March, so, um, our baptismal birthday. So if you join me in singing the baptismal song. Thanks for Show them four times, and it'll probably show them three. 
three times today, I would imagine. I never even heard of it. Jesus Revolution. It's a true story. Yeah. Pardon me? Kelsey. Yeah, Kelsey Grammer is a stalker. Is a, uh, is a, yeah, he's a leader in the church. Oh, yeah. uh, okay. Yeah. Good, good show. Well, thank you. Anybody else? Anything else? I'll take that as a no. All right. <laughs> this is where we left off last time. We are on page three of our handout here. We're still doing the introduction to the 12 disciples. We are on Roman numeral 8, the training. That's where we left off. <coughs> where we left off with this part, um, their message, the only true church, the source of true doctrine, to equip the saints, um, and then teachers and preachers of the good news, and they are able to perform miracles or signs and wonders as we heard in Hebrews chapter 2. After Jesus has pulled them all in, now he's going to send them all out. He chose the 12 that he wanted to have be a part of his uh, Jesus team. I think I brought that up last week. But the team Jesus, you know, of going out and telling everybody about Jesus and what he had done after he's going to leave. And so I ask you this question. What sacrifices have you made in order to get a job? Or to keep a job? And were they worth it or not? Have you ever had to make <laughs> sacrifices to get a job or to keep a job? Our veterans all had to sacrifice being at home. Right, Daryl? Yep. Went on a ship for four years. So. Well, then. Has anybody had to make any kind of a sacrifice for your job? If you're willing to share, now's your chance. Please. Yes, please. I guess you call it sacrifices when your dad went to Kuwait for three years. So that was quite a change for me and for him as well. That's the end of his Christmas family. Yeah. He was there by himself when you joined him out for a little bit, right? Yeah. Sure, please. Uh, avoiding starting a family to keep a job. Okay. Was it worth it? Is it worth those sacrifices you had to make to have that job or keep that job? Well, we made a house payment and food on the table. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now we have responsibilities. It gave us a place to live after you left. Yes, please. Well, I have a question. Okay. A lot of us in here are fortunate enough to have a college degree. You have sacrificed basically four years to get that degree for a particular job, you start that job, and for some reason about in the middle of it, you make a change. Now, you really have to ask yourself, was that four years worth it? <laughs> I guess it depends on where you transition to from your original job. I agree. I agree. Who was right? Who was I'm sorry. Depends on who was paying for that. Degree. Well, I guarantee you, I, my mom and dad are who was For many of you, maybe Uncle Sam paid for your degree through the GI Bill, maybe. Some of it. Yeah. I sacrificed my time. I went to night school for a long time. I graduated in '62. Night school. Lots of night school. There you go. I was there 98 hours on past trips. <laughs> and I, I guess it's maybe sacrifice isn't the right word or changes in your normalcy of how you do things. I mean, it's a matter of uh, have you had to make adjustments to your schedules here and there and those kinds of, I mean, I use the word sacrifice because the 12 disciples pretty much sacrificed everything they had to follow Jesus. I mean, they left it all. Um, and so 
So it's a, it's a matter of what are you willing, what kind of things have we done or have been willing to do for a job? I wouldn't like being out of a job. There are some folks I know who can go from job to job and they're comfortable with that. Well, I've had a wife and kids for, well, pretty much our whole marriage and for not having a steady income or knowing when my income is going to come, I, I couldn't have handled that. So I did go to college. Yeah. And I did get a degree and I was a teacher and then I changed careers halfway through, but it was helpful because I already had a bachelor's degree when I went to the seminary, so that I did exactly what I needed to do when I went to seminary, but we left uh, for a job in Seattle, my, Jennifer and I and our two younger, our two kids, our, we had Rebecca and Sarah at the time, and they were five and a year and a half. And we had left every person we knew to move up to Seattle, Washington for jobs. By that point, we were living in mom and dad's house because they were in Kuwait, but then they came back, so there was the four of us plus the two of them living in the house I grew up in. So it was about time for us to figure something out, right? You know, we were living together. Not that it was bad, but it was a little cramped. And Jennifer and I had never owned a home. And so we decided to move to Seattle, Washington, 1,200 miles away, but only two people we knew was the, the principal and his wife. And then seven years later, we chose to move to St. Louis, Missouri, leaving everything we knew and moved that way. At that point, we had three kids with one on the way and then had a uh, had a fifth one while we were there. But the, the idea of sacrifice is, is, I guess you look at it as a sacrifice if you have to make decisions that affect not just you. I don't remember being a single person, so that has been a very long time for me. I was not a single person for very long because I got married at 20 years old. So um, pretty much everything I can remember about our own lives we've done as a married couple. And so having to, to choose to go down this path. And, he, and a lot of times, if it worked out, great. If it hasn't worked out, then you've probably learned something from it and realized what not to do next time. How do you as parents or as older adults see the paths your kids or grandkids have gone down and keep your mouth shut? Exactly. <laughs> Maybe you don't. Maybe you're more than willing to give well, all of the advice they don't want to give. Mine are big enough they'd slap me down if I got him too much less. <laughs> I got some big great grandkids. Yeah, we're in a we're in a different transition. We still have a, our son in high school, but as you look at your kids and the decisions they're making and the paths they've taken and the sacrifices they've made, and as parents and grandparents, you're gonna sacrifice everything you can to help them get a job or further their education and do those kinds of things. So it's a different time of life for us, but uh, it's different to keep my mouth shut. It's different. Although I got all the free advice I never wanted, so it was one of those things. <laughs> anyway, so. Um, Pastor, just, yes. just a, a question. Please. About when you all moved to St. Louis, uh, you were in school full time. Right. Seminary. Did Either one of you work? We both work. Well, Jennifer uh, left her teaching position, tried to get a teaching position in St. Louis, and it's tough because they know you're temporary. It's like a military wife trying to get a teaching job at a school because uh -huh. they know you're temporary. You're not going to be there forever. And you're at the seminary. And she was pregnant due in November, yeah. and this was June or July, so the odds of her finding a job were a little difficult. So she ended up, up staying in our house and did daycare out of our home for other seminary families. Plus, we still had Joe, um, and Anna would be born in November, so they were both home. I got on-campus work-study jobs. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we lived in a, a, a four-room apartment building in the back of the seminary, and the basement was where we had um, a storage area, so I put my desk down there. I did all the laundry. That's where our laundry was. And I got an on-campus job. I worked in the mail room. I worked uh, for the housing office, and I worked. Uh, I coached basketball. So yeah, we both worked. So Jennifer worked, uh, did daycare for those three years, and I did um, those work study jobs until I, I got the call to go to California. You do what you have to do. You do what you have to do, right? And he did come home very often during the day because we have household duties. <laughs> no. Oh. I found the inside library very comfortable. Yeah. 
<laughs> when in my undergrad days, I, mean, I knew where the library was, but it was just on the way to my car. Yeah. I didn't spend any time in the library. No, as a as a 34-year-old graduate student who's choosing this, and it, it's a whole different perspective going to school. My bachelor's was a means to an end. I knew I had to go. I knew I had C's earned degrees. I knew I had to get out of here, so I hated teaching job. But the seminary was a whole different experience. I had a lot of homework. A lot of homework. I would hope a better experience. Oh, it was a great experience. Yeah. Honestly, we didn't want to leave. I didn't want to leave. Yeah. Like, no, I don't want to go. You can't send me to California. <laughs> I wanted to get out, but I, I, it was a, such a great environment where we lived. Because yeah. we lived in the back of the campus where there were 200 kids. About 200 kids were on campus living in these apartment buildings on the back of the campus. So my kids would just go out and play. It was just a, a community environment that I hadn't experienced before. Because we lived in a, a lived in Seattle, and just off of downtown, actually in a parsonage of one of the churches, and my kids didn't really go out and play. But this whole experience was just in the camaraderie with the other guys and the other families, and it was just an experience that I had not had before, and so I really didn't want to leave. I loved it. But I'm glad I didn't. All of it just turned out the way it was, but all completely worth it. So enough about me. Um, I call it an 18-month seminary education if you're trying to fill in the blanks on your paper. What is the best learning environment for you? Are you a quiet environment learner? Do you need noise? Are you a visual learner? Do you, you hear it once and remember it? Or do you have to read it over and over again? Kind of, you know, get in your brain? Maybe you're a different learner than you were when you were younger. I've always been a visual guy. I think it helps. It helps me to see it and touch it and wrestle with it as opposed to just telling me once and I'll remember. And it's just getting worse as I get older because if I don't remember something, what do I got to do? I'm going to write it down because I'm not going to remember. I really learning environment. I wrote down the event on it. And it was a note. Right? Where did I put that? I wrote that something. <laughs> now you can use your phone, right? Put yeah. reminders on there and I'll shoot it at you as you go. Absolutely. All right, well, this whole thing is an investment by Jesus. That's my point. This is an investment by Jesus into these 12 ordinary men we're calling them. Um, and it's an investment because of who they are. And their personalities and, and what they know. And so, first thing we're going to look at is um, well, B is an investment by Jesus in the 12. And the first one, I'm going to see if you can fill in the blank for me. And he said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not see what whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? And Luke 24 25. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. What kind of a person would you consider that to be? Hard-headed? Hard yeah, I put thick-headed, but it's the same concept. That's what yeah. I was looking for. Right? We just don't, sometimes we just don't get it. I can present it to you, I can put it in front of you, I just don't understand it. And again, as God's people today, it's easy for us to pass judgment some 2,000 years later. It's like, how can you be so dumb? Jesus is flat, flat out telling you. He's giving you modern day examples, and yet you still don't get it. So I call them a little bit of, a little thick headed. Yeah. I it think was, it was new, new ideas that Jesus brought along. So it was a 180 from what, right. what they had probably studied in. Sunday school or something right. growing up. They're in Hebrew school. They knew the law. They knew the things that, that God and Yahweh of the Old Testament had told them. But as Jesus comes with this new message, that's completely different than what they'd ever heard. And they probably had an idea of what the Messiah would be like. <laughs> but yet they still blindly follow. Yeah. You gotta, they took yeah. that leap of faith, right? Absolutely. Please. 
Try a bitch. All right, sorry, I got the corner of my eyes. Uh, we'll talk. All right, uh, number two, they lacked spiritual understanding. So, how do you make someone understand Jesus spiritually? $24,000 question. What's that? Oh, it's not something we do. We can plant the seed or a little water a little bit, right? We can help. <coughs> but it's not up to us. Who's it up to? Yeah. Right. The thought of not being able to make someone understand God in a spiritual way. How do you go about that anyway? What does that look like? It looks like the Holy Spirit has a big job, is what it looks like. Do you know anybody that doesn't know God or Jesus? Have you had conversations with anybody? Or is your circle of friends just Christians and you don't got to worry about it? That's just kind of how I am. I don't know too many people who don't know Jesus. I really haven't ever. Most of the people I've associated with have been my own family. Or church people. I don't get out much. And if I do, it's mostly around Jesus people. So when you talk to somebody who doesn't know about Jesus or lacks this spiritual understanding, it can be a tad frustrating. It's like teaching a second grader or a first grader to tie their shoes. Did they tie their shoes in first grade or kindergarten? You know how to tie your shoes. But to watch that kid struggle to tie their shoes, even though you showed them, you know, ground the loop through the bunny, through the hole, and boom, however you do it, the bunny ears and through, however you do it, and then finally you just say, forget it, I'm buying you slip-ons. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> Sometimes it's easier to go that route. You talk to people about Jesus, and it's just not in their wheelhouse. It's just not something they're familiar with. Is that easier or harder than someone who used to go to church and doesn't anymore? Think about that. Someone who doesn't know Jesus at all, or someone who knew him and has rejected him and hasn't come back. Please. I would say the latter is easier. Someone who already had a knowledge of Jesus? Yeah. Because with the former, you're trying to like <coughs> break down the simple stuff like it was Jonah and not Noah and the whale, or something like that. Whereas they are Anybody else have a different opinion? Uh, it would be hard to talk to someone that knew him before and doesn't know him now. You think that's harder? Yeah. Than someone who has no idea? Yeah. So you think a blank but slate person is easier? So hard to make their mind. It's hard to make All right, so they may have preconceived notions that they've already had these. Yeah. Let's pretend they were part of the church and have left for whatever reason. Um, the image that comes to my mind is like scar tissue. You know, when you've been a part of a church and for whatever reason you've chosen to leave, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of a negative experience or something negative that leaves scars, right? Scar tissue. Yeah. As opposed to somebody who's brand new with nothing. I'm not saying one's better than the other. I, I see the validity of both. Please. I have a friend that's an atheist, and uh, it's hard for me because he is so, but he brings up God in conversation, but he wants to, he'll say things like, well, what if you were grown up a Hindu or a Buddhist? You'd probably be a Buddhist, wouldn't you? I go, yeah, I'll probably, I grew up a Christian, and he did not. He said, it's our upbringing that makes us who we are. But I said, aren't you a little afraid to die? No, I don't. I'm not afraid to die because I don't believe any of that stuff there is. He doesn't believe in heaven or hell. And I told him it's going to be gloomy. But uh, anyway, it's hard to break through. This is a, 
I pray for him all the time and ask the Holy Spirit to do it. But I cannot. But I'll keep trying. It's hard. Not, a, not just somebody who was former Christian and not anymore, but someone who's a totally different faith. Oh, yeah. They have, like you're talking about, a Hindu, but they yeah. kind of can help a Hindu understand who the one God is, not the 20,000 or however many they have nowadays. But how, how does that fit? And especially um, with a lot of those folks, it's cultural. You know, they grew up that way. You know, that's their, that's their, it's not just their religion, it's their culture. I tell my parents that are in the nursing home how much we, as my brothers and sisters, appreciate them raising us as Christians. That they, they didn't have a lot of money, and they said, well, we didn't leave you able to leave you anything. And I said, what you left us is so much more than cash. You left us with uh, believing in Christ. So we all need to, we that had Christian parents need to be so thankful. I think seeing other people, trying to get them on the path is tough. Yeah. It was easier to grow up that way. I think. I, I can't argue with it. That's all I've done. Yeah. But the whole reason of talking about spiritual understanding is if as part of being a disciple of Jesus, not just the 12, but us as well as a follower, is our responsibility is to help other people understand who Jesus really is. And how do you do that? How do you go and make disciples of all nations? Well, you baptize with the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Right? So Jesus says in Matthew, but how can we help somebody understand Jesus a little bit better who may not know him? You, you make don't, it simple. Very simple. And the hardest part, and, the, and, the, and again, this you got to build a relationship with somebody and to be able to have that kind of conversation at times, I think. That's always been my thing. I can have a conversation with somebody that may be hard or difficult if I have a relationship with them because they kind of know where I'm coming from and I know who they are, their background is. Absolutely. Please. I think, like Dan said, and, and by then seeing what Jesus is in your life, you know, I probably be kind of slight about it, but I, I think by what they look and see in you is a reflection. Right. Yeah. And of course, praying and giving it to God to, to make it happen. As you said, it's not us. It's the Holy Spirit who does the conversion. But we are held to uh, an offer to some responsibility for those around us who maybe don't know Jesus. And that's the how do you do that? All right, so they lack some spiritual understanding. Again, in answering the question, how do you make someone understand? You don't. God is the one who does all of that work. In Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 to 28, is a discussion that the disciples' mom has with Jesus. I don't have it up on the screen, so if you want to pull out your Bible, you're more than welcome to, or listen to me read it to you, but... You probably know this already, or have heard it. Um, Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 to 28. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to Jesus with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, what do you want? Well, I'm sure he said something nicer. Nicer tone of voice. What do you want? That nicer? That sounded kind of mean, didn't I? <laughs> what do you want? What do you want? <laughs> I'm busy. <laughs> Jesus would not say it that way. She said to him, Say that these two sons of mine are to sit one at your right and one at your left in your kingdom. Jesus answered, You do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? They said to him, We are able. He said to them, You will drink my cup. To sit at my right and my left is not mine to grant, but for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. And when the ten heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know, bless you, that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Whoever would be first among you must be your slave. 
even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. In Mark chapter 9, they have this great discussion of, I am the greatest of all time. The goat, right? The greatest of all time is Muhammad Ali. That's what he said. I am the <coughs> or if you're a Tom Brady fan or whatever you think is the goat of the person you think it is. Remember, there are also in the previous chapter of Matthew, they're talking about who is the greatest, right? Which are you talking about? That's what they were going to do. We're going to do this. are fine. Right. They lacked humility, is the word I'm looking for here. They lacked humility. Hey, we left everything to go be with just as letter number three, by the way. Um, we left everything to follow you, Jesus. you got to give me some kind of credit for that, right? You can get a little. The word I learned in the seminary is chuffed. You ever heard that word before? I am chuffed. No? Never heard that one before? I didn't either until I went to seminary. One of my seminary professors used it in my Greek class. Happened to be the guy who wrote the Greek textbook I took for the class. That's an interesting thing. If you've never had a class from somebody who actually wrote the textbook. Oh my God. Yeah, it was very, uh, anyway. <laughs> kind of a, an odd dude, but he knew his stuff. But the word chuffed means puffed up, or, you know, I'm, I'm the greatest. I'm, I feel pretty good about myself. How are you? How do you spell that? C H U F F E D, chuffed, right? I don't know how to spell it, I just want to say it. <laughs> well, I'm just. Chuffed! Oh, okay, I'll look it up. No, I'm not just wanted to be sure. <laughs> just to be sure I was here. Chuffed! Yeah. Alright, I'll look it up. <laughs> this was part of my ADP, if you don't know that about me. Did I spell it right? Yes. <coughs> Move with regular or sharp puffing sound, it says. Very pleased is the adjective. I'm dead chuffed to have one. Anybody know where it comes from? The word tigers. Comes from the Britain, it says, right? <laughs> British informal. 1950s dialect chuff. Plump or pleased? Well, I would resonate with plump, but <laughs> I am. Chuffed, I have one. Anyways, uh, they lacked a little bit of humility. They wanted to be the greatest. After all, they're with the greatest of all time, Jesus, right? They saw what he was able to do. They knew he was the son of, they believed that he was the son of God, and he could do these very cool things, right? This is in Matthew chapter 20. They spent a lot of time with Jesus and seen him do a lot of things. Not still understanding the hum humility of Jesus, but seeing more of his power and hoping hey, that's going to pass on to me, especially when Jesus is gone. We're going to have that. Plus, remember, he did give them the opportunity to go out there and heal people. How could it not puff you up? They're humans. Okay. So, they were thought themselves the greatest of all time. Here's your Greek word for the day. Hold a list. Oh, right, let me find it here. Holipistia. Holipistia. There you go. Are you impressed? Yeah, I got a 67 on my qualifier. <laughs> By the way, I only needed a 65. I had two points to spare. <laughs> it doesn't matter, right? I mean, they, they ordained me as a pastor. I passed, right? Um, what it is when Jesus says, Oh, you of little. Right. This is the word for faith. This means uh, you of little. They lacked faith at times, right? They did. Yeah. <laughs> you see all these human characteristics coming out in them that we resemble, that we've seen. We've had little faith. We've been, uh, we've lacked humility. We've lacked spiritual understanding. Okay? And this is one of my, not one of my favorite parts, but does anybody have any questions about that part? Oh, where'd I go? There we go. They lacked I love this painting. Do you know what this painting is of? This, there's, uh, in the, you can't in make the Garden it of Gethsemane, it. they come to the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus gets arrested. arrested. What did they lack here? Well, first of all, what happened to them all? <laughs> they took off. <laughs> Peter got all freaked out, right? Pulls out the sword and cuts the dude's ear off. Yeah. I don't see that in this little painting. What's the guy's name? Malchus? The guy named Malchus who got his ear cut off? That's his name. Just more trivia for you. For your Put it right back on, isn't it? 
Malchus got his hair cut off, Peter put it back on. Put it back on, yeah. Right. Jesus, Peter cut off, Jesus put it back on. <laughs> that wasn't what I said to you. <laughs> <laughs> I blame you. Did you do that? Yeah, you know why? What? Because you gave me a big old donut for like a half an hour. <laughs> and I ate three quarters of it. <laughs> I'm on a little bit of a sugar rush, if you haven't noticed. <laughs> they lack commitment. That's the word I use. Jesus' betrayal and arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane, what happens when they spread? They, they take off. Are they committed to the cause? <laughs> yes and no. Tough spot, guys. I mean, it's easy to point the finger at them. It's easy to point the finger and say, boy, what happened to you folks? I mean, come on. How do you bail on Jesus at this point? They're freaked out. They take off. Pastor, you know that uh, Peter denied Jesus three times, but he was one one of the only ones that followed them back to the where they were uh, having this trial. Right. So the rest of them Obviously, Judas goes and does his own thing. Yeah. So the other ten take off. Yeah. Peter follows behind. Yeah. Goes, he goes. wants to see what's going on. Right. What's going on? And finally, they lack power. Acts 1 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria. And the end of the earth is the promise of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, Spirit of Pentecost, and it's a tongue of fire over your head. That's my. Did you see that's how I They lack power because they're still getting this education. They're still getting this feeling for what God is asking them to do. So why are these twelve men? 2 Corinthians 12, 9, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. That's fitting, isn't it? God's grace is given. What we need has been given to us, you know, Ephesians 2. For my power is made perfect in weakness. What's St. Paul talking about here? Our weaknesses, God's power still comes out. Because God's power is going to do what it's going to do. I think it was last week we had that conversation about how do I um, how do I talk to somebody about Jesus? Do I say anything at all or do I just say, oh, Jesus loves you, amen, and that's it? I think it was a conversation about I don't say something because I don't want to say the wrong thing. On doctrine, right? I think that was last Sunday. I don't want to talk to somebody about this because I don't want to screw it up. I don't want to tell them the wrong thing about Jesus. Then all of a sudden, I cannot be a witness. But even what God says is what? His power is still going to be made there even though we are weak and don't say the things that we're supposed to <coughs> in the way that maybe we're supposed to. And of course, they will reflect the light of Christ when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men. They were... I turned it off. Astonished. And they had been recognized that they had been with Jesus. They reflected the light of Christ. What did St. Paul say? That we are supposed to be Jesus with skin on or something like that. The light of Christ comes through us. Well, that hasn't dinged me out yet. Is that dinger off today or what? All right. We're going to keep going because I'm going to finish this thing today. Why us? Why has God called us to be bearers of his gospel or good news? Why us is not the right question. What is the right question? Why not? Why not us? We call ourselves Christians because the Holy Spirit has come to us. My parents brought me to church. The Holy Spirit has brought me to faith. Why not me? Why can't I share the gospel with somebody else? And if I can't and I don't feel comfortable, what can I do? Hide it under a bush. No. Don't let Satan blow it out, you know, all around the neighborhood. Absolutely. So my final question is, can you name all 12 apostles? And the one replacement? Sure. Can you name them all? Sure. Go. 1, 2, 
Peter, James, is John, Philip, Bartholomew, Judas, uh, Matthias was the one that they threw the knife for. Uh, I, that's a bunch. Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, Simon, Thaddeus, James, and Judas. And they go by other names as well, but these are the twelve. And the one replacement, which you already gave away, good job, is good old Saint Matthias, because Judas um, takes his own life, he doesn't see any hope in what he had done in repentance. And so it was of good order to have 12. So they had to add, what were the qualifications of, uh, of, of adding a 12? Do you remember? Besides shooting the dice, right? And God's gonna tell us what happens. Basically they put it in a bowl and they shook it out and whatever else came out, there were two of them. That'd be an eyewitness of the resurrection, right? That's what it took to be an official a apostle or disciple. They had to have been around Jesus and seen his miracles and maybe they done. And there were two, and Matthias got his name chosen to replace Jesus. I got a question for you, Master. What do you think about Luke? <coughs> was he not? You know, he, he was he not was, one of the twelve. No, he was not one of the twelve. But he was there. But he was there, and he. How do we he, know he was there? He wrote Luke, and he wrote the Acts. He did, but he uses a pronoun in a lot of his writings in Luke and Acts. What does he say? Us and we. We. Yeah. Meaning, I was there. I saw it with my own two eyeballs. But he was a physician. Steve, that is correct. It wasn't part of the club. Nope. Hey, it looks like Matthew would like to drink a little beer. Like donuts. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> they want to make a little plump guy, don't they? Looking good. I tried to find a picture of all of them to make the plump guy look like Matthew. He was rich. Right, absolutely. All right, so next time. Next time in two weeks. Next week, you're the comfort dogs. Oh, yeah. For Sunday school. The week yeah. after, we'll start, um, <laughs> I guess it's called the Apostle with the Foot Shaped Mouth. I don't always think about what I say, but what I do is late because I've already said it. Not you? Open mouth, insert foot. We're going to talk about St. Peter. Who he was, what he did, how God used him, and all of those things. Where's the bell? Uh, the bells didn't ring for some reason. Did, did they ring at 830? Or 825? It's not. What time is it? It's time to go. Let's pray. We'll get you out of here. We thank you, dear God, for giving us this chance together today. We lack lots of things, humility, spirituality, sense, common sense, and sometimes love for our neighbor. But we thank you so much for making us your disciples, a follower of you through the work of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the 12 disciples that you've chosen to use to um, spread your good news that has affected us today. That's why we're here. Please be with us as we continue our day today, as we get a chance to worship as well. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're not going to use this anymore. No, nope, we're finished with this. We finally did. Oh, it took us six weeks. I'm glad. Can you do that anymore, Daryl? <laughs> <laughs> no. I want Matt with